You are listening to the Fresh Hell Podcast. Fresh Hell contains stories of a disturbing and often graphic nature and is intended for a mature audience. Please don't let your kids listen to this, or they might turn out like us. Hi, and welcome to Hell. Fresh Hell. I'm Annie. And I'm Johanna. And together we bring to you the international tales of murder, mystery, and the macabre. So, Annie, you made a new Facebook group, and I think we received some really nice messages and suggestions for future episodes. Am I right? Yeah, there's a Facebook group. It's called uh, Fresh Hell Podcast, Murder, Mystery, and the Macabre on Facebook. It's a place where Fresh Hell listeners, calling them the Fresh Hellions, can chat with us about cases that we cover. You can suggest new cases, share memes, and it's a closed group. So you can do it without your mom or your mother-in-law or your boss finding out just how into murder you really are. That's good. We really do love to hear from you and we love to read all your feedback. And one message we received said that they really enjoy how we mostly focus on old-timey cases. And I have to agree, these are my favorites too. So for this episode, I decided to do another one of those. Today, you will hear the story of Karl Denke. Yeah, I don't know this one. This is exciting for me. I am here for it. Are there any warnings for listeners with this one? Yes. So first of all, I think not many people outside of German-speaking countries have ever heard about this story. And I will warn you, it is pretty graphic. I would recommend you not eat while you listen to this episode if you have a weak stomach. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and even in Germany and Austria, it is not widely known. And I think one of the reasons why this case didn't attract much attention was that around the same time, a very similar case was brought to light. But I will talk a little bit more about this later on. Okay, sounds good. So as always, when talking about these stories, we need to sit down in our DeLorean and fasten the seatbelts <laughs> because we are going back to the year 1860 when this German horror tale begins. To be more specific, it all starts on the 11th of February, 1860, in the small town of Oberkunzendorf. And I know all of you love those German names, right? <laughs> I do. <laughs> no, Oberkunzendorf. That was the day Karl Denke was born. Okay, so this is a small town in Germany that we're talking about? Yeah, that's right. Back in those days, it was a German town, but after World War II, so in the year 1945, the whole area became part of Poland, and it is still to this day. Oh, all right. Karl Denke, he was born in 1860, and we don't know a whole lot about his childhood, but we do know that he was the third child. His family was middle class, neither rich nor poor, but they had everything they needed. Karl's father was said to be a little bit on the pedantic side. Unfortunately, we don't know much more about his parents, but we do know a little bit about his years in school. So, Karl suffered from a delayed development. He was a very slow learner and he couldn't speak for a very, very long time. His parents actually believed the boy to be mute. But at the age of six, he finally started to speak, even if it was only a few words. And that is actually something that wouldn't change for the rest of his life. Karl Denke never spoke a lot. That's hard. Uh, but maybe his dad talked enough for everyone. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> he was so pedantic. <laughs> So once he was in school, it took weeks to teach him a few basic words. And even those he pronounced in a really weird way. He was stretching the vocals, which led to him talking really, really slow and in a slurred manner. But not only his speech was off, he also moved really slowly and as little as possible. So he was kind of a sloth. <laughs> Whenever someone would try to shake his hand, he would barely lift his right arm, so you had to reach down and grab his hand just to encounter a weak handshake. You know these kind of handshakes that make you feel like you were holding a dead fish? That was Karl Denke. Oh man, yeah, I do know the dead fish handshake. I once ended a blind date because of the dead fish handshake. <laughs> Actually, I have some real serious blind date stories I could tell you guys. Yeah, this sounds like, I don't know, do you think today he's somebody who would have been diagnosed maybe as autistic or, you know, do you think he had some serious developmental delays? I mean, either way, if it was one of those things, it wasn't a great time period to have any sort of special needs. Oh, definitely. I'm almost 100% certain that he had some developmental issues. As for the autism, it could be, but, you know, it's really difficult to say with the little things we know about this case. And in school, of course, the teachers got annoyed and they called him an idiot and they said he will never accomplish anything in life. 
And I say, of course, because we should keep in mind how school in Germany was back in those days, you know, white ribbon style. I don't know what that means. I haven't seen that. Is it? A, it's a German movie, right? Actually, the director is uh, Michael Haneck, and he's Austrian. He's one of our most famous directors, and I have quite a love-hate relationship with him because, <laughs> honestly, his movies are awesome, and they capture the, the German and the Austrian soul perfectly. The White Ribbon, it was also nominated for uh, Best Four and Language Movie in the Oscars. It sets place in a German village at the beginning of the 20th century, and it illustrates really well how children were raised back then. All right. I'll check it out. You're definitely the show's uh, resident cinephile. And if you liked it, I think you and my husband actually have very similar taste in film. So, oh, he uh, will love it. He will love, love it. it. And I, I once did a whole uh, Michael Haneke uh, weekend where I just was binge watching his movies. And at the end of the weekend, I was severely depressed because his movies are really <laughs> depressing, but really, really good. Check him out. I will. So when Karl Denke started school, he was punished regularly by his teachers. But after a while... His behavior improved. He got a little bit better. His grades were a little bit better. They were still average, but yeah, he learned more and everything increased slightly. The other thing is he didn't have any friends and he never participated in any games the other kids played during recess. He pretty much hated school and very often his older brothers had to lift him up and carry him back to his classes because he just refused to attend. And he also wet his bed regularly. And this is something that would continue for the rest of his life. Oh, God, that's just a nightmare for everyone. Normally you would say, okay, he had a difficult upbringing, but I couldn't find anything that, that uh, indicates something like that going on. So in his childhood, he at least had a little bit of a relationship and friendship with his brothers. But this changed also very soon after Karl Denke finished his education. He started to work for his father and he flat out refused to have anything to do with his siblings. He wouldn't go out with them. He wouldn't go anywhere he wouldn't play with them nothing he also never went to the tavern or to dances or to any other festivities and you have to remember that's a small town in germany like all those small towns i think back in those days people were were hungry for kind of distractions like dances or things like this oh definitely yeah yeah but he liked to be all by himself and often he would just wander through the woods alone he never had any romantic interest in women quite on the contrary it seems as if he was quite a misogynist okay all right so i guess it sounds like his brothers were just doing the only thing they knew how to do but i could see why he'd still resent it but why why did something happen do we know why he hated women so much i have no idea there's just too little information about that but i couldn't find any record that he, he had some traumatizing encounters with women at any point hmm. when carl was a little bit older he one day just left his home and he didn't return for nine whole months his family had no idea where he went they didn't receive a letter or a postcard he was just gone and when he finally returned his family learned that he had worked in a quarry and later on in construction but that's all he ever told them about this episode in his life he never gave them any explanation about why he left or why he returned one day he was gone nine months later he reappeared as if nothing had happened that's definitely a little bit bizarre huh but i mean i guess at least it seems like maybe he's capable of holding a job and living on his own which i guess must have been a relief for his family yeah it, it seems like i mean he managed to survive for nine months yeah yeah i mean that's got to take a little bit you must be so afraid that something's happened to him yeah. and then he comes back and he's fine so it's like i would imagine a lot more than just the relief he came back yeah, I just remembered uh, I used to work as a bartender for many, 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 many years. And I used to have a, a regular customer and he once told me that he did something very similar. He had a nervous breakdown and he just left home and wandered the woods for weeks. And then he finally found him and he was almost starved. Wow. I just yeah. remember that now. I feel like, please, if I have a nervous breakdown and need to disappear, let it be somewhere in the Caribbean or, you know. <laughs> Please don't let me end up wandering in the freaking woods, mm -hmm. spidery, tick-filled woods. Ugh. I'm not a fan of the forest. I like it from a distance. <laughs> well, I'm not a fan of, of your U.S. forest since Blair Witch, but you know. <laughs> let's not talk about that. <laughs> Fair All enough. Right. So Do you want to actually hear a really funny Blair Witch story? Yes, please. <laughs> So I didn't see it in the theater because I'm I'm 
you used to be a real scaredy cat, but my sister did in the summertime and it was on Cape Cod and camping is really, really popular on Cape Cod in the summertime. They watched, they went and saw Blair Witch and they were one of the first people to see it. You know, it was like opening night or the second night or something. And it was such a huge thing back then. When the movie ended, there was a couple in front of the, in front of them and the girl jumped up and she was like, if you think for one goddamn minute that I'm going to sleep in that fucking tent tonight, this relationship is over. I totally understand. <laughs> so, all right. So he made oh. it out of the woods, though. He didn't yes. get the Blair Witch. Back to Karl. No, we don't have the Blair Witch. We have other witches here in Germany that <laughs> children like Hans and Gretel. <laughs> so time passed and you know how it is. Eventually, Karl's parents died. He didn't show any emotions and appeared to be rather cold and indifferent at the funeral and in general about his parents' death. His siblings tried to take care of Karl because... Quite frankly, they didn't think Carl could manage to take care of himself. He continued to work in his family's company for a while, but was rather unreliable. He would not show up to work one day or was always late. And as before, he would leave his home and often disappear for days. In this time, he would wander through the woods once more. After a while, he spent more and more time away from his family. And finally, there came the day when he returned home one last time only to pack up all his belongings on a horse-drawn carriage and leave his family and his hometown for good. So he's going to seek a fresh start for himself. Do we know how old he was? Yeah, that was in 1880, and Karl Denke was 20 years old at the time. And he moved to Münsterberg. That's a town six kilometers or 3.7 miles southwest of Oberkunzendorf. Münsterberg, which nowadays is called Zibice, had a population of roughly 6,000 people. So it's a pretty well-sized town for that yeah. time. Yeah. Is that where is that where Munster cheese is from? Mm, I don't think so. Okay. <laughs> you know, I'm always thinking about cheese. <laughs> Who doesn't? <laughs> well, except for my ex-husband, because my ex-husband hated cheese. Yeah. Well, he hated <laughs> cheese and he hated Elvis. I don't know why I ever married this man. <laughs> Seriously. So at first, Carl rented a small apartment, but very soon he bought himself some property. And I think that's great because I haven't managed to do that yet. He bought a house. The house had three units. He rented out two of them, two apartments, and he kept one small room for himself where he lived in. The room he lived in only had four by four meters or 13 by 13 feet. It's not that big, no. There was also a little garden, a shed that was used by Carl, and in the back of the property, he later on built a little swampy pond or something like that. But it seems that simple-minded Carl was pretty much scammed because he paid three times the value of the property. And his siblings heard of this and they feared Carl would lose all of his inheritance in a short amount of time and they desperately tried to receive legal guardianship for him. Weirdly, the family pretty soon changed their mind about that. And the reason I read was that they had a conversation with a doctor they knew and this doctor flat out told them, that he wouldn't think this was a good idea because they should consider that people like Karl Denke could act out in a violent way if they're put in a situation like this and therefore the people of Münsterberg would have to quote fear for their life. Oh wow well that's a hard position to be in in the first place if you ever need to take guardianship or power of attorney over uh, a family member but why did the doctor think that he would be violent was it just a general warning do you think or do you think his symptoms were more like psychotic in nature more of a serious mental health issue and less to do with like developmental delays I don't know. I think this was more of a general warning. And it's a weird warning at that because Carl had never shown any signs of aggressive behavior or outbursts. I'm not even sure if the doctor ever really met Carl. It was more like the doctor was an acquaintance of the family and was just some kind of weird advice he gave them. Anyway, from that time on, Karl Denke stayed always very suspicious of people on his surroundings. He would talk even less and always got very angry whenever people would look at him in the streets and he almost had no more contact with his siblings. And there was also a strange rumor that was making its rounds at the time and that said Karl Denke was neither a man nor a woman. Oh, that's a strange rumor to it is. start going around. I feel bad for his siblings too, actually, because yeah. it's got to be so hard when you love someone and feel responsible for their well-being and they don't understand what your position is you know it's, that's a hard place to be in it's hard for everyone involved yeah. i think yeah oh yeah 
But we have to say one thing. To be fair, his neighbors and many other people that knew Carl said, yes, he was weird, but he was never aggressive. Only one neighbor told the police that she was always very, very scared of him and never dared to enter his apartment. He was always quiet. He earned money by selling vegetables and fruits, and he made little wicker baskets and bowls out of wood. And whenever he saw beggars or vagrants, he would invite them in, offer them a meal, and often gifted them some items of clothing. All this gave him the reputation of being a charitable man, and people started to call him Vater Denke. Oh, well, okay. See, here's here's the thing. I still don't know whether I'm supposed to feel bad for Karl Denke, or if he is the villain in this story. I still don't know where this is going. But I feel like you're trying to lull me into a false sense of security before you tell me something horrible. Oh, so you want to hear the horrible stuff. <laughs> I forgot where we are. <laughs> I mean, that's it's why we're here. But OK. All right. So True. it's going to get bad. OK, here it goes. On the 21st of December 1924, a young wandering craftsman named Vincent Oliver passed Denke's house. He had already knocked on a few doors offering people help or repair work in exchange for money or food. And in his pocket, he already had a few coins because before Christmas, people always tend to be more generous. He knocked on the door of the house number 10. Karl Denke opened and offered the young man 20 cents if he would come in and write a letter for him. Denke said he can't read or write and he would therefore really need the help with the task. Vincent gladly accepted the offer, entered the small and very dirty room and he sat down by the table. Karl Denke handed him a pencil and a piece of paper. He positioned himself behind Vincent's back and he told him to write down what he was about to dictate. So he started. Dear Albert, you fat belly <laughs> that can't be right thought the young man and thinking he must misunderstood he slowly turned his head to look at denke when he was hit on the head with a pickaxe <laughs> always those pickaxes <laughs> oh no always so apparently with our stories you're you're gonna need that flux capacitor and also a pickaxe <laughs> a regular axe would also be acceptable we'll also accept a matic which is essentially just like another axe-like instrument of doom fresh hell all the axes all the time <laughs> <laughs> It's so bad. Oh, easily God. available. <laughs> <laughs> they were. Yeah, they were. Oh, God. That's awful. So, I'm just laughing because the wording of his letter that cracks me up all the time when I read it. <laughs> so, you yeah, can you belly. imagine? <laughs> yeah. To be fair, if I was the one writing it, I would have been like, that's a legit description of my belly. So <laughs> Still, it feels unnecessary. We just met. Come on. <laughs> Good for Vincent because the fact that he had turned his head saved his life. Because instead Good. of being hit at the back of his head with the, you know, pointy end, always <laughs> stick with bit. the pointy end. <laughs> <laughs> the pig -like only slightly scratched and bruised his right temple. Oh. Carl, seeing that, jumped at him and the struggle ensued. And even though Carl was already 64 years old, the young and very strong Vincent had no chance to fight him off. Carl was in such a frenzy that he latched on tightly to his victim and he didn't let go of him. So Vincent started to scream for his life. And fortunately, some people heard all the commotion and rushed into Carl's room. And it took several people to free Vincent from the old man. Carl then sat down at the table, red faced twitching, shaking, and grinding his teeth. <laughs> so basically like the stereotypical cartoon version of a killer. Right, yeah, that's, that's how they always look. <laughs> <laughs> but now comes the best part. The people who had rushed in thought, well, if Father Denke attacked this young vagabond, he clearly tried to do something to this poor old man. So the police came and they arrested him. No. That is Vincent's. Not Carl Denke. No. Yes, even though this had not been the first time something like this had happened. A few years back, another wandering craftsman had been running out of Denke's place, screaming and covered in blood. I think he just wanted to leave this world like he went into it, you know, screaming and covered in blood. <laughs> Oh, but man. Of all, another homeless person had stated that he too had been asked inside to write a letter. And when sitting at the table, Denke had tried to strangle him with a chain. No. How many times does someone have to run screaming covered in blood from the same house before neighbors think there's a problem? It This kind of reminds me of that one Dahmer victim who got away only to be kind of 
sent back in by the police. It's yeah, absolutely. That, yeah. That's also always one one story where I'm like, what, what the hell? He's like, but Dama was really cold blooded there because he just was like, yeah, that's my friend. I I gotta yeah. take care of him. Just tell Sorry. him. Over. Yeah, he, they pretend. Well, yeah, we'll 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 get into it when we cover Dahmer one yeah. of these days. <laughs> but wow, that that's crazy. That's awful. And that's not all that happened. But obviously, I will talk a little bit more about that later. So okay. Vincent was taken in by the police, and only the next day after Vincent's asking and and pleading and telling the police over and over again what happened, and he was begging them to go and arrest Karl Denke. So finally, the next day, they went to Karl's house and they took him to the police station. The neighbors even complained about that and protested the arrest because how could the police take this poor man with him just because of the statement made by an obviously lying beggar? But still, the police wanted to talk to Carl to find out what had happened once and for all. They placed him in a little prison cell and when they went to pick him up for interrogation, they found him dead. Carl Denke had strangled himself with his handkerchief. Okay, I was not expecting that. And with a handkerchief. So can we take a second and just think about the optics of that? Because how do you, strangling yourself has to be hard because wouldn't you pass out before you died and then it would like loosen the pressure and then you'd live? And I mean, how how big was this handkerchief? It was the size of a, of a blanket. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was actually, that was, was pretty much out of nowhere. And uh, how he did it, I can also tell you that he had tied his handkerchief to a ring in the wall. The ring was used to um, put the, the chains in. Yeah, so he had tied his handkerchief to this ring in the wall. And then he lay down on the floor, his neck in the noose, and pressing down his whole body weight and slowly suffocating. Okay, that makes more sense. I guess a handkerchief is, well, not blanket size. <laughs> <laughs> it would, I, when I think handkerchief, it's like I imagine it's like a, I don't know, the little thing that you wave, you know, like almost yeah. like a pocket square size. So I'm like, how the hell? No, 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 no. Yeah, more like a scarf. It, no, German handkerchiefs are like the Pashmina size. Oh, okay. <laughs> See, you do learn something new. So it really was. It was like a shawl size, like yeah, a scarf. Yeah, yeah, we are very shawl. practical people, you know, you always have oh. something to cover yourself and... <laughs> Okay, I'm imagining like either his neck was very thin or it was very stretchy fat. Was it knit? Because maybe that, okay, now it makes sense. Uh, Maybe he uh, ripped it up to make it longer a little bit. That could be possible. Oh, maybe. But if it's like pashmina, if it's like shawl or pashmina size, even just. No, I was kidding, it wasn't. It (laughs) was. I believed you. I should have kept that because the next time you would be like at a at a cocktail mingling and you would say, did you know that German handkerchiefs are pashmina sized? <laughs> You're just, well, I'm just imagining, you know, my dad carries a handkerchief. I know he still carries a handkerchief. I'm always trying to find handkerchiefs for him for his stocking for Christmas. I'm just imagining my dad when, before he retired, you know, going to work in a suit and just grabbing a pashmina and jauntily <laughs> tossing it over his shoulders so he could blow his nose on the corner of it later that day. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right. So, so now they've got a dead Carl Denke. Yes, we have the dead Carl Denke. And <laughs> obviously the biggest problem, of course, was who the hell was going to pay for his funeral? <laughs> Apparently nobody stopped for a minute thinking, hmm, I wonder why this man killed himself. No, they didn't care. The police went to Denke's apartment to search for some money for his funeral, but what they found was beyond their wildest nightmares. Oh no, tell me everything. So the first thing the officers found when they started to search Carl Denke's home were huge amounts of salt. Many, many boxes of salt. Okay, but was he fighting actual demons though? (laughs) He was not. (laughs) Personal demons, maybe, but not actual demons. Okay. There were pots and bowls everywhere. And in it, huge amounts of pickled meat. In total, they found 15 huge pieces. But it was not pork or beef. No. (laughs) It was human flesh that had been cut up and preserved. They found pieces of a hairy chest, (laughs) ribs, bellies that still showed the belly button, and the most horrifying piece, if you can call any of these more horrifying than the others, was a hole behind with the anus neatly cleaned and paired. 
No, that is such a specifically awful detail. <laughs> yes, it is. I understand now why you told people not to eat while they listen <laughs> to this one. Oh, told no. Ya. Yeah, okay. They also found a whole bucket full of human lard and on the stove another buttock in some kind of uh, sauce Alfredo. No, why did it have to be Alfredo? That's my favorite <laughs> sauce. Oh, man. No, thanks. I'm full. <laughs> Yeah, there's more. Oh no, of course, there's always more. All right. Okay, the good thing is they didn't find heads, arms, legs, or private parts. Oh, that's fucking great. Great, right? <laughs> <laughs> but they found jars, bags, and boxes full of teeth. Why? No. <laughs> Fuck, not teeth. Yeah, they were all in a very specific order, like um, he ordered them matching sizes and stuff like this. And in total, it was 350 one teeth. That's so many teeth. <laughs> maybe he was a tooth fairy. Oh, maybe. Oh, do you know that? <laughs> Sorry. So I keep telling my poor dad, he's going to be like, stop talking about me on the damn podcast. <laughs> um, I was staying down at their house once visiting and I realized I didn't bring any pajamas. And my mom is um, the older she gets, the skinnier she gets. So I went into an old bureau of drawer, chest of drawers to grab one of my dad's old like undershirts because that's perfect sleep shirt. And I opened it up and there's like a little wooden compartment where you'd put like cufflinks or change or whatever on the top drawer. And in it were a whole bunch of teeth. And for a second I was like, are those teeth? It was like the sweetest thing. It was our baby teeth. It just cracked me up because I was like, why does dad have all these teeth? <laughs> And then I was like, oh, these are our teeth. That's okay. Well, we don't have the tooth fairy here. Still, my dad has like a box with our baby teeth. Apparently, parents don't want to throw out for whatever reason. No. Maybe they do some kind of ritual with that, though. <laughs> Who, knows? Who knows? Whatever. Karl Denke hit 351 teeth and they definitely were not his kids' teeth. Yeah. The coroner examined those teeth and he declared that those teeth belong to at least... 25 people, more likely more than 30 people. And the teeth showed that most of the victims had been men older than 40 years. Only a few belonged to young men. Yeah, I mean, I guess older people are often going to be more vulnerable. Yeah, right. I think that's the reason. They are more easily to to attack and to mm -hmm. overpower. Yeah, remember the shed? Yeah, in the shed and in the little pond, they found bones. Oh. So many Bones. Bones from arms, bones from hands, ribs, femurs, hips, even a whole spine. For quite a while, bones were even found in a close-by forest, and the bones overshowed rough edges, which led to believe that they had been separated with an axe. Yeah, but uh, there's still more. This is crazy. This story is nuts. I can't believe I've never heard this one before. This is total nightmare fuel. Yeah, it is. They found piles and piles of clothes and rags all washed, all neatly folded in a very, very peculiar way, rolled up and tied together with some weird-looking strings. And only upon further investigation, they found that those weird-looking strings were made out of human skin. By the way, fun fact, haha, these strings, these skin strings, they were also used by Karl Denke to make his wicker baskets. You remember the one he sold? Oh, no. I would seriously be that one bitch in town who was finally like, get yourself organized. You're a trash panda. Get your shit together. <laughs> like, clean your stuff up. And so I'd go and I'd buy a ton of baskets. And then later I'd found out they were made out of people. People. <laughs> Sorry. Anytime I find out things are made out of people, I have to do that. But yeah. How that's... you find out? <laughs> <laughs> it's just it's just now between the baskets and oh I'm all right so am I I'm not alone in in thinking it puts the lotion on its skin right <laughs> <laughs> well I was actually not thinking that you said get organized trash panda what would uh, Marie Kondo say to that <laughs> Marie Kondo, if Marie Kondo came into my house, she would have a heart attack and just <laughs> expire on the spot. But I, let me just keep, what other stories can I tell you so I don't have to hear what else they found in this house? <laughs> we're almost, we're almost done. Kondo. No, no, it's, I mean, it's absolutely awful. And it, it still keeps giving because, listen to that, there were also three pairs of suspenders Made of human skin, uh, oh. some still showing breast and pubic hair, including crabs. No. <laughs> and even a nipple. Oh, man. 
Yeah, what he later found out that a fourth pair of suspenders was worn by Denke when he got arrested. And of course, they also found, you know, typical identifications, personal belongings, whatever the, the victims had on them. And they found some loose pieces of paper. And you remember when Karl Denke said, oh, I, I'm sorry, I can't read or write. You have to help me. Yeah, bullshit, because he could read and write just fine. Because on that loose paper, there were 30 names. Karl Denke had noted the weight of all his victims, the weight before and after he cut them up. And here comes the funny thing, because his female victims, they were only marked with the first name. His male victims had entries that included full name, date of birth, if they were married and some other special stuff they had on them. He had already written down the number 31, but the line next to it stayed empty. Oh, so the guy that got away. Now it all starts to make more sense, right? So even the letter that he was having him write you fat belly yeah so now i'm thinking he must have invited in this guy it sounds like he preferred to kill people with meat on their bones i guess for lack yeah. of a better term and then you know saying how he would give people well of course he had all these clothing from the people he murdered that's what he gave to the people who were too maybe too thin for his liking yeah do you think i i guess he you know like the the witch in hansel and gretel he's i guess he had like a, a stick and he poked them in the side and the people were like so stop poking me what are you doing <laughs> That's crazy. You're not a fat belly. You can go better <laughs> off. <laughs> yeah. Wow. They even found the name of a victim that had been found in Münsterberg in 1909. That's even more tragic than everything else because an innocent man had been in prison for this murder for 12 years. And after they found that out, he sued the government. I think it's safe to assume that Karl Denke had been killing people for many many decades and i think 30 victims is a rather conservative number yeah i i agree completely i don't think that he was off finding himself in a zen <laughs> way when he would disappear from the family house but it just seems impossible doesn't it that this had been going on for such a long time and no one had any suspicions yeah well i'm glad you say that because obviously all the neighbors were asked by the police and little by little they found out that there were indeed little things that should have made people suspicious so people said even during the hardest times of german hyperinflation that took place between 1921 and 1923 and it's very comparable to the great depression so even during that time he always had a lot of meat people first thought that he was eating dogs no the monster yeah he wasn't so he wasn't that big a monster. he had so much meat that he once was seen eating two pounds of meat for one meal. Oh. He had so much meat that he could invite people in to have meals with him. Also, the neighbors had often witnessed a foul smell coming from Denke's apartment and his little shed. And once they complained to him about it, it stopped. Oh. He was seen throwing out buckets full of red water oh, no. <laughs> he was seen carrying huge pots full of meat from the shed to his room the neighbors often heard him hammering and sewing all through the night and he was also seen leaving his home with huge packages and he always came home empty-handed there was so much i mean you and me annie we would need only the blood water bucket and we'd be like murder murder <laughs> No, but then we read about this kind of stuff all the time. I think the foul smell and the bloody water would for sure. Yeah, but we always expect these things to happen. But yeah, I think we're kind of disappointed that they don't happen. <laughs> <laughs> I'm okay if they don't happen. <laughs> I'm true, but still, these neighbors, they give me a, you know, not my monkeys, not my circus kind of vibe. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But it's, oh, God, it's so bad. So they know he definitely killed 30 or most, more than likely killed 30. And that that poor man spent 12 years in prison for a crime he didn't commit. But yeah, it just it sounds like he killed a lot more people than 30. It kind of reminds me a little bit of Ed Gein. Yes, yes, absolutely, Ed Gein. But also, this was not the only German cannibal. And I mentioned before that there was a reason why this case didn't get as much attention and is pretty much forgotten nowadays. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because on the 19th of December uh, 1924, so two days before Vincent Oliver knocked at Karl Denke's door, one of the most famous trials in German history found its end, and it was the trial of Fritz Hamann. He was sentenced to death for the murder of countless young men, and he too had cooked them and eaten them, but he also had sold their meat to unknowing customers. 
Definitely. This is another case that I want to cover very soon. And now I found like five famous cannibalism cases in, in Germany. And I think it's going to be like a thing for the next few episodes that are going to cover. <laughs> You're going to cover a lot of cannibals. Wow. Yeah, I'm sure I don't know most of those. Another thing, if you compare Harman to, to Denke, Harman, he got arrested and he didn't commit suicide and he talked. He talked a lot. And the transcripts from these interrogations, they still exist. Karl Denke, on the other hand, we don't know a lot about him and we don't know a lot about how and why he murdered his victims. He rarely talked about trivial stuff to people and then he killed himself in the end. So this makes everything so much more difficult to grasp. Yeah, but now knowing all of this, I don't know if I think he was even autistic or learning disabled anymore. It sounds like he just was completely psychotic. I don't know. It's, yeah, he's awful. So, and I definitely would like to hear more about the Fritz Harman case too. You know what? Now that I think about it, I wouldn't even put it behind Karl Denker that he planned all this oh, I'm so, so dumb and I can't read and write all the time so that people wouldn't just back him, you know? Like this thing, he was playing a different person. Exactly, yeah. I don't yeah. say that he was super clever, but I don't no. think he was like he made himself to look like. He was clever enough to conceal things, and I think he knew that if he seemed like somebody who would be normally considered a vulnerable member of the population, then it would be less suspicion on him that he would actually be the person to be afraid of. Yeah, and yeah. it made him also kind of trustworthy, I think. Yeah, He's definitely. just this old man, and what can he do? Yeah. Ugh. So as I say, there are a few other cases of cannibals in Germany. There's Joachim Kroll, who was active during the 70s. And maybe you know that one, the most recent one, um, rather famous, Armin Maivis, the cannibal of Rotenburg. That one I know. Yeah. So I think sooner or later we will talk about all of these cases, if you are interested. Yeah, yeah. Let the, you guys should tell us if you're interested listening. Yes. <laughs> I know I'm interested. But I won't even eat meat off a bone, right? Like normal meat. It just grosses me out. So I never eat chicken wings or ribs. No Disney turkey leg. No thank you. It's just I hate chewing meat off a bone. It really grosses me. <laughs> so these stories are just so awful to me. That was so awful. Crabs. Why? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, and the nipple. Oh, God, it's awful. All right. Thanks very much. <laughs> All right. Tell me something good. That really was. That was um, very interesting and very, very awful. So tell me something good. Have you watched anything or read anything? Or Yes, I do have recommendations today. So first off, I watched a new Ted Bundy movie, Extremely Wicked, Shockingly Evil and Wild and what a title, right? I love it. I know. I can never remember the name. <laughs> uh, I can highly recommend the movie. I think a lot of people dislike it because they were expecting something else. But if you go and watch it with an open mind, you will not be disappointed. And Zac Efron, wow, he's he's so good in this movie. Like, really surprisingly good. Mm. And the end scene is, I don't know, it, it did hit me like a pickaxe. So I haven't actually finished it yet. I started it last night and then Paul came home and I shut it off because he doesn't he's not so into the murdery things but yes I think Zac Efron is amazing and the biggest thing I can say about it is I love the soundtrack <gasps> it's so good it's so good the soundtrack yeah I think that a lot of people I've read uh, criticism and I haven't finished the film yet but there's been a lot of criticism about how it just makes Ted Bundy look like this nice guy and like he was he was horrific he was a monster and like he should be portrayed that way but you know I think we were talking about this the other day it's how it's like you really need to remember though that a lot of the time these people don't look like monsters and Ted Bundy did not look like a monster and this whole movie is from his girlfriend's perspective so it's of course that's not how she saw him and that's not how the majority of the women that he murdered horribly saw him yeah I'm looking forward to seeing the end now when I was watching the movie, I was like, Annie, you, you have to watch a movie. They use Crimson and Clover. And I love we love that, that song. song. We yeah, love it. I really do. I wish we could like use whatever music we wanted for our podcast. I'd put that in there. If we ever do a live show, we'll have to come out to Crimson and Clover. <laughs> it's it's good. It's got a real slow beats for my for my hobble. <laughs> yeah, no, that that's like one of those um, teenage party slow dance songs. Yes. Like Kevin Arnold, you know? Yeah, but Bundy... Uh, Definitely didn't look like a psycho killer. Qu'est-ce que c'est? <laughs> <laughs> I love that song too. I do too. 
All right, I have one more funny story for you. You know when somebody is like really rude to you or they insult you or you're having a fight with somebody and then only much, much later do you think of a good response and you're like, oh man, why didn't I say this smart, clever quip at the time? It's always way too late that I think of something you know, snappy to say. But once, oh God, this was years ago, I was going grocery shopping. And so I parked at the grocery store and I have a handicapped placard, but I don't look disabled. Like you wouldn't necessarily look at me and see what's wrong. <laughs> so I've had quite a few people will stop me and ask me, is that really my handicap placard? And it's Sometimes it's annoying, but also I kind of get it. It just depends on how they ask. It's usually if they're just like, hey, is that your handicap badge? I'll be like, yep. And they're like, okay. Or, you know, oh, sorry, you need it or whatever. And it's no biggie. But this one particular day, I was in a ton of pain. So I had sciatica going down both legs and my whole spine was just really angry. And I just had to get in, grab a few things and get out before I ended up literally crying in the middle of the store and leaving without any of my grocery shopping, which has happened several times. So I get out of the car and this older man who's walking up the parking lot screams at me. He's like, miss, you have to move your car. Can't you read? That's for handicapped people only. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> and I'd had it. And I just turned around and said, yeah, it's mine. And, you know, kind of rudely. But then he yells again at me. And he's like, well, you sure don't look handicapped. You shouldn't take advantage of this. And I swear to God, it I don't lose my temper often. I really don't. But I turned around and yelled back at him. Looks can be deceiving, can't they, buddy? Ted Bundy didn't look like a serial killer and you don't look like an ignorant old asshole. <laughs> going in and it was it was just fuck that guy it was he was so rude he was like the angriest old man ever Ugh, so good for yeah. you yeah well thanks everybody so much for for joining us for another hour of or however long it's been of misery and hell that really was bad that was a that was a bad story <laughs> Please do uh, come say hi in the Facebook group. You can find us everywhere you listen to podcasts. We'd love it if you would take a minute to rate, review, and subscribe. And you can email us at freshhellpodcast at gmail.com. So until next week, if you are going through hell, keep going. Tschüss. Bye.